She was not only known for her beauty and style, but also her high-profile marriage to the Duke of Argyle, Ian Campbell. However, what made her even more famous was the scandalous divorce case that rocked the media in the 1960s. The Duke and Duchess of Argyle lived a life of luxury, constantly making headlines in newspapers and magazines. From the lavish lifestyle to the sensational divorce, we'll uncover the secrets and stories that captivated the public's attention. Join us now as we delve into the scandalous life of Margaret Campbell, the Duchess of Argyle. Beauty from the Dusk The beautiful ones are not yet born is a popular quote that consoles the desperation in men who hope to go down with charming daughters of the earth. But what if you know that more beautiful ones had once existed? Here is Ethel Margaret Wiggum, a woman who was destined to captivate the world with her beauty, charm, and romances. Margaret, as she was commonly known, was born in London, England on November 17, 1912, to a well-connected family. Her father, George Hay Wiggum, was a self-made millionaire and chairman of the Selenese Corporation. Her mother, Helen Mann Hannay, completed her family circle. But Margaret's life was far from ordinary. Now, she was quite the unique child. As an only child, she basked in the adoration of her father, George, but faced constant criticism and belittlement from her mother, Helen. Helen was obsessed with Margaret's looks, so much so that she even put restrictions on her reading, fearing it might damage her eyesight. Can you imagine? Now, George had made a fortune in the manufacture of Selenese, an artificial silk. But here's the twist. Margaret, despite her family's wealth, would never be caught dead wearing that fabric. She had her own sense of style, and it was all about looking fabulous. As a young girl, Margaret had a keen eye for observing adults and absorbing their ways. At the tender age of 10, she made one single friend who happened to be the epitome of the poor little rich girl, Barbara Hutton, the heiress to the Woolworth's fortune. These two must have been quite the duo. Fun fact, Barbara later gifted her London home, Winfield House in Regent's Park to Joseph Kennedy, the US ambassador in the UK and father of the future president, John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Now, Margaret made countless trips to London during her childhood, and some of them were quite interesting. Since she had a little deformity with speech, she was determined to cure her stammer. So off she went to the famous speech therapist, Lionel Logue's clinic, the same one featured in the film, The King's Speech. She also sought help from a psychiatrist to tackle her supposed lack of a sense of humor. They even suggested she watch Charlie Chaplin movies for some laughter therapy. But alas, neither the stammer nor the humor issue were fully resolved. Oh well, at least she tried. When Margaret's family finally returned to the UK when she was 13, she brought her glossy American glamour and confident style with her. And boy, did she make an entrance. The lackluster London social scene didn't know what hit it. She was a wealthy heiress, and she knew how to turn heads. Every day after school, her chauffeur would whisk her away in the family Rolls Royce, leaving her fellow pupils in awe as they played hockey in their galoshes and white tunics. Talk about a glamorous life. But Margaret's teenage years weren't without a bit of drama. At the age of 15, she found herself in a bit of a pickle after a holiday fling on the Isle of Wight. You won't believe it, but she ended up pregnant. And guess who the father was? None other than the dashing 18-year-old David Niven. It was said that Margaret adored him for the rest of her life. Growing up in New York City, Margaret's stunning looks became the talk of the town. She had youthful flings with Prince Ali Khan, millionaire aviator Glenn Kidston, and publishing heir Max Aitken, who later became the second Lord Beaverbrook. However, it was a fateful encounter in 1928 that would change her life forever. During a holiday at Bembridge on the Isle of Wight, the 15-year-old Margaret found herself caught up in a whirlwind romance with the future actor David Niven. At just 18 years old, David and Margaret succumbed to their passions, resulting in a pregnancy that left her father furious. Determined to keep the shame under wraps, Margaret underwent a secret abortion at a London nursing home. The family cook, Elizabeth Duckworth, vividly remembered the chaos that ensued. Despite the tumultuous turn of events, Margaret's adoration for David Niven endured until his last breath. In a twist of fate, she even attended his memorial service in London as one of the VIP guests. But Margaret's journey was far from over. In 1930, Margaret made her debut in London's high society, earning the title of the year's most prominent debutante. The path to marriage seemed clear when she announced her engagement to Charles Guy Fulke Greville, the seventh Earl of Warwick. However, love had other plans for her. Margaret's heart belonged to Charles Francis Sweeney, an American businessman and golfer from a wealthy Pennsylvania family. She followed her heart, 
breaking off her engagement to pursue a life with Charles. Throughout her life, Margaret would be known by various names, including Margaret Wiggum, Margaret Sweeney, and eventually, Margaret Campbell. She became a fixture in the social scene, dazzling and captivating everyone she encountered. From posh parties to elite clubhouses, Margaret was adored and sought after by London's most eligible bachelors. Her first marriage vow? Let's take you deeper into this interesting life of Margaret Wiggum, a woman who embodied glamour and elegance like no other. After her conversion to Roman Catholicism, Margaret tied the knot with Charles Francis Sweeney on 21st February 1933 at the Brompton Oratory in London. The ceremony was a grand affair, but it was her wedding dress that stole the show. Designed by Norman Hartnell, it poised Margaret as the only surviving daughter of the sun. The dress received so much attention that it caused a three-hour traffic jam in Knightsbridge. Can you imagine the commotion? From that day forward, Margaret became synonymous with style and refinement. She had a keen eye for fashion and was a loyal client of renowned designers such as Hartnell, Victor Stiebel, and Angèle Delange. Even before the Second World War, Margaret was a fashion icon, known for her impeccable taste. She was immortalized as a classical figure in photographs taken by Madame Yvonde, joining the ranks of society's most alluring beauties. Margaret's marriage to Sweeney brought three children into the world. Tragically, their first issue, born in late 1933, came out as a stillborn. However, their family grew with the birth of another daughter, Frances Helen, in 1937. Frances later married Charles Manners, the 10th Duke of Rutland. Margaret and Sweeney also welcomed a son, Brian Charles, in 1940. But behind the scenes, Margaret endured a heart-wrenching series of miscarriages, a total of eight, before experiencing the joy of motherhood. However, Margaret's life was not without its share of hardships. In 1943, she suffered a near-fatal accident when she fell down a lift shaft. She recounted the terrifying incident, saying, I fell 40 feet to the bottom of the lift shaft. The only thing that saved me was the lift cable, which broke my fall. I must have clutched at it, for it was later found that all my fingernails were torn off. I apparently fell onto my knees and cracked the back of my head against the wall. It was a miraculous escape from death, but Margaret's resilience prevailed. While Margaret's marriage to Sweeney endured for a while, it eventually ended in divorce in 1947 after World War II. The reason for this abrupt separation has remained in secrecy throughout history to date. But Margaret was not one to dwell on misfortune. She swiftly moved on to her next romantic interest, briefly becoming engaged to a banker at Lehman Brothers, Joseph Thomas. However, their engagement was dissolved when he fell in love with another woman. Life took yet another twist when Margaret found herself captivated by Theodore Rousseau, the curator of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. She described him as very bright, funny, and self-confident to the point of arrogance. Although they didn't form a formal relationship, Margaret and Theodore continued to visit each other, even though she had reservations about his suitability as a stepfather to her children. Through the highs and lows, Margaret Wiggum's spirit remained indomitable, a duchess. Beautiful Margaret caught the eye of the handsome Ian Campbell, the Duke of Argyle, while they were both on a train to Paris. But here's the twist. The Duke was still married to his second wife at the time. Ah, the allure of forbidden love. Unable to resist the magnetic pull between them, Margaret and the Duke couldn't help but embark on a passionate affair. And before long, they found themselves standing at the altar in March of 1951, ready to embark on a new chapter together. Now, you might think that Margaret had finally achieved the fairy tale ending she had always dreamed of. After all, she had wealth, looks that could rival any Hollywood starlet, and the title of Duchess, not to mention the keys to a historic castle. Life seemed to be nothing short of a bed of roses for our dear Margaret. But alas, appearances can be deceiving. In her later years, Margaret would reflect on her life and confess that she had been under the impression that she was mentioned in Cole Porter's famous song, You're the Top. She believed she was the epitome of elegance and sophistication, recognized as one of the 10 best dressed women in the world. However, it turns out she was mistaken. It was actually Pelham Grenville who tweaked the lyrics for the British version of the song, mentioning her as, You're Mussolini, you're Mrs. Sweeney. Oh, the irony. Now here is the real gist. The Duke of Argyle hatched a wicked plan to get his hands on Margaret's money for the restoration of his family's ancestral home, Inveraray Castle. He supposedly cooked up a scheme where he forged a fancy-sounding document called a deed of sale. And guess what? 
He used precious items from the castle as collateral to seal the deal. Can you believe the nerve of that guy? Someone cannot help but imagine the audacity it takes to pull off something like that. It's like a plot straight out of a juicy soap opera. The Duke was willing to go to extreme lengths to secure those funds, even if it meant resorting to forgery and deception. This is truly a real-life drama unfolding before our very eyes. Not to be outdone, Margaret herself played her part in this sordid drama. She resorted to forging letters in a desperate attempt to cast doubt on the legitimacy of her husband's sons from his previous marriage. This depicts how high people would go in the pursuit of power and control. To top it all off, she even had the audacity to consider acquiring a newborn baby to pass off as the rightful heir to her husband's noble title. But let's not forget the extravagant parties and lavish lifestyle that the Duke and Duchess indulged in. Their names were synonymous with excess and debauchery, their every move scrutinized by the prying eyes of the public. The scandalous whispers and raised eyebrows only added fuel to the fire, making their story even more tantalizing to the masses. And so the stage was set for the grand finale, a very public divorce in 1963. The secrets and lies that had festered beneath the surface were finally exposed for all to see. The once glamorous Duchess of Argyle found herself at the center of a scandal that rocked the upper echelons of society. Second Divorce Within just a few short years, the Duke and Duchess's once promising marriage began to crumble like a sandcastle swept away by the waves. The Duke, it is said, had quite the vices, addicted to alcohol, gambling, and prescription drugs. He was a troubled soul, described as physically violent and emotionally abusive by his previous wives. Now here's where things took dark turns. The Duke, consumed by suspicion, accused the Duchess of infidelity. And get this, he took matters into his own hands while she was away in New York. He enlisted the help of a locksmith to break open a cupboard in their Mayfair home. Margaret Campbell, the Duchess of Argyle, had a secret locked drawer in her home. When her husband finally broke into it, the contents shocked him and the world. In the 1963 divorce case that followed, the Duke presented a set of Polaroid photographs as evidence. And what was in those scandalous photos, you ask? They showed the Duchess in the nude, adorned only by her signature three-strand pearl necklace, in the company of another man. There were even more explicit photographs showing the Duchess engaging in sexual acts with a man whose face was conveniently hidden. That was pretty much ridiculous. Soon rumors began to circulate, with some suggesting that the mysterious headless man in the photographs was none other than Duncan Sandys, the Minister of Defense and son-in-law of the legendary Winston Churchill. The speculation was so intense that Sandys even offered to resign from his position in the cabinet. The drama was unfolding like a gripping novel, captivating the public's attention. But wait, there's more. The Duchess wasn't about to be silenced. She counter-petitioned the divorce, accusing the Duke of committing adultery with her stepmother, Jane Corby Wiggum. However, due to a lack of witnesses, she dropped her case on the very day of the hearing. Little did she know that this decision would come back to haunt her. The list of alleged lovers grew longer, with as many as 88 men being implicated. Can you believe it? The Duke believed that his wife had been involved with government ministers and even members of the British royal family. The Duchess was not able to reveal that many of the men named were homosexual, as homosexuality was illegal in the United Kingdom at the time. To protect their identities, she remained silent, allowing the public to believe the worst about her. The photograph of the headless man was presented as evidence against her, painting her as a fallen woman, a seductress, the judge's words and the relentless public scrutiny soon earned her the infamous nickname, Dirty Duchess. It is really tragic when the truth becomes distorted and a woman's reputation is tarnished by a scandalous divorce. The Duchess's side of the story was stifled and she faced public condemnation without a chance to defend herself. The whispers, the judgment, and the public defamation only served to deepen the wounds of this troubled union. It was truly a turning point in the Duchess's life. Despite the devastating loss, she displayed resilience and a touch of defiance. Sporting a sassy red feather hat, she confidently went to lunch with her friends in Paris, believing she would emerge victorious from the divorce battle. However, her hopes were shattered when a reporter delivered the news that she had indeed lost, and the court had dealt her a severe blow. In that moment, she realized her world was imploding before her eyes. Once the divorce was finalized in 1963, the Duchess received a settlement of 500,000 pounds. It was a substantial sum, but it came at a high cost. 
The scandal had tarnished her reputation, and she found herself shunned by society. The once shining star of high society was now an outcast, condemned for her alleged promiscuity and immoral behavior. Lord Wheatley, the presiding judge, had made his opinion of her clear, stating that she was a thoroughly promiscuous lady with a sexual appetite that could only be satisfied by a variety of men. He further criticized her progressive views on marriage, calling them absolutely immoral in plain English. Despite the public scrutiny and ostracization, the Duchess remained a prominent figure in society. She continued her philanthropic work, striving to make a positive impact despite the challenges she faced. Her resilience and determination were admirable, as she refused to let the scandal define her entirely. Then, as for the Duke, well, it seemed he wasted no time in moving on. He moved on immediately for his fourth marriage, and unfortunately this time, that was the last. Matilda Mortimer, the granddaughter of a New York banker named William Costner, went in with him as his fourth. They tied the knot on June 15, 1963. However, their union would be short-lived, as the Duke passed away in 1967, ten years after their marriage. And so, the saga of the Duke and Duchess reached its conclusion, leaving behind a trail of scandal, heartache, and shattered reputations. Aftermath Following her highly publicized divorce and the subsequent loss of much of her wealth, the Duchess of Argyle faced a series of financial challenges. In an attempt to regain some financial stability, she turned to writing. She published a memoir titled Forget Not in 1975, which received negative reviews for its perceived name-dropping and sense of entitlement. Additionally, she delved into the entertainment industry but didn't succeed. With her financial resources dwindling, the Duchess took the unconventional step of opening her London house, located at 48 Upper Grosvenor Street for paid tours. The house had been lavishly decorated by Siri Mom in 1935 for the Duchess's parents. However, despite her efforts to monetize her assets and reputation, her extravagant lifestyle and ill-considered investments ultimately left her largely penniless by the time of her death. In 1978, the Duchess's mounting debts forced her to leave Upper Grosvenor Street and move to a suite at the Grosvenor House Hotel. In April 1988, she made a television appearance on a Channel 4 program called After Dark, where she discussed horse racing. However, she left the program prematurely citing fatigue. As her financial situation worsened, she was unable to pay the bills at the hotel and was eventually evicted. With the help of friends and her first husband, Charles Sweeney, the Duchess secured an apartment to live in. However, as time went on, her children decided to place her in a nursing home in Pimlico, London. It was there that she experienced a significant decline in her financial situation and quality of life. Tragically, the Duchess died in 1993 at the age of 80, impoverished and alone, after suffering a serious fall in the nursing home. Her funeral, a requiem mass, took place at the Church of the Immaculate Conception in Mayfair. She was laid to rest alongside her first husband, Charles Sweeney, in Brookwood Cemetery in Woking, Surrey. Although the Duchess had initially considered having her biography written by Charles Castle, she ultimately changed her mind. Castle went on to publish The Duchess Who Dared, The Life of Margaret, Duchess of Argyll, in 1994, shedding further light on her life and the scandal surrounding her divorce. The book was reprinted in 1995 and again in 2021, coinciding with the release of the TV series A Very British Scandal. The Duchess of Argyle was known for her candid and sometimes sharp remarks. Her comment to the New York Times about the lack of style and class in modern times reflects her opinion on societal changes. She also acknowledged her own vanity, describing herself as always vain. Another quote attributed to her highlights her fondness for poodles and pearls, emphasizing their importance in her life. In popular culture, the Duchess's life has been the subject of artistic interpretations. The chamber opera Powder Her Face, composed by Thomas Aides with a libretto by Philip Henscher, premiered in 1995. It explores significant events in the Duchess's life and presents a complex portrayal of her character, evoking both sympathy and contempt. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.